When 33-year-old mother of two Heidi Broussard suddenly disappeared, suspicions fell on her fiancé, Shane Carey. But as detectives pieced the puzzle together, an even more disturbing picture began to emerge, one that involved Heidi's best friend Megan and a deadly hoax. On Thursday, December 12, 2019, Heidi Broussard awoke in her Austin, Texas apartment. She then woke up her two children, a six-year-old son and her three-week-old daughter. As Heidi readied herself for the day, her fiancé Shane left for work at 6.30. Heidi then took her kids to Cowan Elementary school to see a book fair that was being held. She didn't stay long and after dropping off her son, she left with her daughter at 8.12 a.m. Shane phoned his fiance at 8.30 to confirm that she had dropped off their son. Little did Shane know that that would be the very last time he would hear Heidi's voice. After he finished work early that afternoon, he called her again but the calls went straight to voicemail. When Shane arrived back at the apartment block he and Heidi lived in, he noticed Heidi's car, a white 2012 Honda Fit, parked in the lot. He assumed she and their daughter were inside the apartment. However, when he reached the front door, he noticed something strange. It was unlocked, and there was no one inside. Nothing seemed amiss, and all the items were perfectly in place. Shane figured she must have taken the baby to the park, but as the hours passed and she didn't return, he began to grow concerned as to how Heidi would fetch their son without her car. He decided to head over to the elementary school, arriving at 5.50 p.m. After collecting his son, the pair waited for Heidi, but she never arrived. After some time, Shane headed back to the apartment with his son. He decided to check Heidi's car to see if there were any clues as to where she might have gone. Strangely, he found the car was also unlocked, and Heidi's red purse containing all her personal belongings was sitting inside. Not only that, but all of the supplies needed for their newborn daughter, who suffered from jaundice, were still in the apartment. Shane knew Heidi would never leave without her belongings or their baby's necessities, at least not for long. Panicked, he began calling friends friends and family, but nobody had heard from Heidi. Finally, at 7.31 p.m., Shane called the Austin Police Department and reported Heidi and their daughter as missing. A search was swiftly conducted throughout the area, and flyers of Heidi and the couple's daughter were widely circulated. The next morning, Shane provided his first official statement to detectives eager to cooperate. After gathering as much information as possible, detectives obtained an emergency disclosure order and ordered an emergency ping for Heidi's phone number, which showed up as active. The hope was that this 48-hour ping would provide a location that could serve as a starting point for the search for Heidi and her baby. Later that day, Shane appeared on television, making an emotional public plea for the safe return of Heidi and their child. As news spread of the disappearance, there was an outpouring of love and concern, but none were as distraught as Heidi's best friend, Magen Firamuska. Heidi and Megan had met as teens at a Bible camp and often referred to each other as besties. In 2019, the lifelong friends bond only deepened when they both discovered they were pregnant at the same time. Megan was even present at the birth of Heidi's daughter, driving from Houston to Austin, despite being heavily pregnant herself. Because Megan lived in Houston, Shane had given her a set of keys to his and Heidi's apartment, which she used as a base for several days. When Megan was contacted regarding her best friend's disappearance, she was quick to point the finger at Shane, claiming she had warned Heidi against him and alleging abuse. She would certainly not be the last to suspect foul play regarding Shane Carey, but the truth was far more sinister than it appeared. On Sunday, December 15th, after the emergency 48-hour ping yielded no results, Shane made another desperate public plea, begging for Heidi to come home and for anyone to reach out to him. To most, it appeared that Shane was an emotionally broken man, unable to cope with his distress. But not everyone was convinced. Meanwhile, investigators tried to remain as neutral as possible, concluding that either Heidi had left voluntarily or she had been kidnapped. But Heidi's friends refused to believe she would ever leave her son, and one even alluded back to Shane's involvement and his behavior after learning Heidi was missing. In the account, the friend was quoted as saying, I specifically remember a time she was at my house and did didn't answer the phone. He showed up to my house, freaking out right after work. It seemed the loving and doting figure Shane was playing to the public differed from the accounts of those close to Heidi. And as the days passed, more and more people began to doubt his version of events. It was eventually revealed that Heidi had repeatedly tried to break things off with Shane in the past, and had accused him of physically assaulting her in March 2019. She even documented photos of the bruising to her arms and legs, and sent them to a friend. As rumors swirled, investigators were running out of time, and with no no suspect in sight and no concrete evidence against Shane, it seemed they'd hit a dead end. It was only on December 18th that a woman identified only as M.W. contacted detectives about an encounter she'd witnessed at the apartment complex where Heidi and Shane lived on December 12th. M.W. told detectives that she had been driving through the complex when she noticed a light-colored car parked perpendicular to the allocated bays. Then, she saw a white female leaving the area between buildings 7 and 8, carrying an infant in her arms. Another woman exited the driver's seat of the light-colored vehicle and greeted the woman with the infant before helping the pair into the back seat of the vehicle. Seconds later, the vehicle drove away.
away. With this new information, police began investigating other avenues such as Heidi's circle of friends. This led them directly to Megan. Exterior cameras of the apartment complex were accessed and footage from December 12th showed a light-colored vehicle consistent with the description of Megan's 2015 Nissan driving northbound toward the rear of the complex at 9.05 a.m. on that fateful day. With their sights now on a possible lead, authorities tracked down Megan's address, where she resided with her on-and-off boyfriend, Christopher Green. FBI behavioral units concluded that the presence of Megan in the complex on the day of the disappearance, plus her proximity to Heidi and her family, was enough to make her a person of interest. On Thursday, December 19th, the woman identified as MW was invited back to the police station and shown a photo lineup featuring the pictures of six similar-looking women, one of which was Megan Firamuska. When MW saw Megan's photo, she stated that she was 60 to 70 percent sure this had been the woman from the vehicle at the complex on December 12th. A warrant was then obtained to access data from the number associated with Megan's phone, and the data showed that the device had been located in the area near Shane and Heidi's apartment on December 12, 2019. Authorities jumped into action and immediately immediately ordered surveillance of Megan's residence, both ground and aerial. Operators were then able to observe a light-colored vehicle parked in the backyard of the residence, concealed from street view. That day, authorities also observed Christopher Green as he headed to the nearby Target where he purchased baby clothes and formula. As he exited the store, he was flagged down by Texas DPS investigators. He revealed to them that he and Megan had broken up in March of that year, but continued living together. Allegedly in the spring, Megan had told him she was pregnant. During the pregnancy, Megan's stomach became enlarged, but Christopher never observed her unclothed and could only speculate that it was real. Investigators then showed Christopher a flyer of the missing Heidi and her infant daughter. When Christopher locked eyes onto the child's image, he exclaimed, that's the baby at my house. He also told investigators that on Friday, December 13th, he had come home to find a baby on the bed. Megan told him she had gone into labor and not to be mad. DPS investigators arrived at Megan's residence and when Megan came outside, began to question her. She voluntarily complied and explained that she had gone into labor on December 12th at a birthing center in the Woodlands, but she could not recall the name of it. She also claimed that she had not been in Austin that day, despite cell phone data indicating otherwise. With all the evidence indicating foul play, investigators stormed Megan's property. There, they located an infant that matched the description of Heidi's baby. When officers approached Megan's car, a foul odor emanated from the trunk. With this suspicious development, a search warrant was swiftly obtained and officers could search the vehicle. As the trunk opened, the stench of decaying flesh overwhelmed the officers. There, shoved into a black duffel bag, was the decomposing corpse of Heidi Broussard. After the discovery, Magen was arrested, and the infant was transported to the hospital as a precautionary measure. The following day, Magen Firamuska was charged with two counts of kidnapping and one charge of tampering with evidence which was eventually upgraded to capital murder after the body was confirmed to be that of Heidi Broussard. Her cause of death was ruled as ligature strangulation. Her best friend has asphyxiated her to death using a leash and then her hands. Megan had faked her own pregnancy and turned on her childhood friend, desperate for a child of her own. She had been plotting for some time to take the infant, possibly from the first moment Heidi disclosed her pregnancy. After the infant was confirmed to be that of Heidi's daughter, she was returned to the safety and care of her father. Megan had at no point injured the child. It would take two years for the case to be built against Magen, and on March 10th, 2022, the hearing finally began. Megan pled guilty to the murder of Heidi Broussard and accepted a plea deal, waiving her rights to appeal. She was sentenced to 55 years in prison. In 2023, the harrowing and tragic case of Heidi Broussard was adapted into a lifetime movie titled Stolen Baby, featuring actors Emily Osment and Anne Hopkins. The movie chronicled the friendship between the two women and the cold and callous nature of Megan's decision to scheme against her best friend. As Megan was sentenced to her fate, questions lingered. Was Megan ever truly pregnant? Or was it a part of her calculated deception? What motivated her to turn on her lifelong friend in such a callous manner? And how is it possible that no one saw it coming? The harrowing events surrounding Heidi Broussard's tragic demise left a scar on the community, raising unsettling questions about trust, friendship, and the depths to which some will go for their darkest desires. In 2012, a quiet, middle-aged man named Peter Keller brutally murdered his family and vlogged about the ordeal before retreating into his self-made bunker deep in the forests of the Pacific Northwest. The question on everybody's lips was, why? 41-year-old Peter Keller was a keen survivalist who regularly vlogged about his escapades and interests in survivalism, and for years on end had been quietly preparing a sanctuary to which he would eventually retreat from the world. He stockpiled the bunker and filled it with equipment necessary to wait out whatever global 
global disaster may happen to strike. Inside the Rattlesnake Ridge bunker, Keller had his ammunition, weapons, a bulletproof vest, and enough food to survive a nuclear winter. Peter had been described as reserved and introverted, but was generally considered pleasant by all those who knew him. He grew up surrounded by nature in a small North Bend town. Like most of the men he grew up with, Peter settled down, got married, and had a child. Peter married the equally unassuming Linity Keller, and the pair had a daughter named Kayleen. The family had an ordinary life by all accounts, residing in a typical suburban home with few reports of conflicts or hostilities. Little did their friends and family know that something in Peter Keller was brewing beneath the surface, and it was entirely deadly. Peter began withdrawing socially, becoming more and more preoccupied with survivalist tactics and theories. He was also leading a double life. While seemingly normal on the outside, Peter Keller was harboring a dark fear of an impending doom, an apocalypse that no one would be prepared for, except him. In the months leading up to the murder of his wife and daughter, Peter Keller religiously vlogged about his plans as he built his survival bunker. He would allude to the murders as something he wasn't looking forward to, but something that he also didn't even question anymore. In his video, he claimed he was under no illusions as to what could happen to him if the police caught on, stating that although he had an escape plan, his last resort was to kill himself, and that he didn't know if he would be dead within the next two or three weeks. He never exactly referred to the reason as to why he would later commit his atrocious acts, simply stating, just the more I've thought about it, the more I understand it. I don't really feel bad about it. It's just the way it is. Certain things happen that caused this to happen. On April 22, 2012, Keller methodically murdered 19-year-old Kayleen and his wife, Linity, by shooting them both in the head with a silenced weapon. He then set fire to their North Bend home to cover up the crime before fleeing to his bunker in the woods. As authorities grappled with the aftermath and the community reeled from the loss, the main focus was on the whereabouts of Peter Keller. It seemed he had vanished into thin air. A massive manhunt was launched, and the area and surrounds were methodically searched. But Keller was well prepared, and the forest served as a temporary respite from the clutches of justice, allowing him to remain hidden for some time. But it wasn't long before authorities tracked him down in his remote location in Rattlesnake Ridge. Keller had survived several days on the run, but on April 28th, it all came to an end. Investigators triangulated a rough area based on photos found in the Keller home, as well as tips from residents who had spotted Keller's red pickup truck in the area. Experienced trackers were assembled who noticed freshly made tracks in the woods, which appeared to be made by someone wearing a heavy backpack. As authorities circled the area, the smell of wood was wafting out of a heavily camouflaged structure within the area. The bunker had several entrances and ladders, and appeared that it could potentially also be booby-trapped. SWAT teams surrounded the bunker, trying to force Peter Keller to come out. There was no way of safely entering the bunker without possibly being injured or killed by Keller or his traps. The standoff lasted the night, and despite using tear gas, it was believed that the bunker was far too dense for Peter Keller to be affected much, or that he was potentially wearing a gas mask. Sensing that escape was futile and being fully surrounded, Peter Keller found another way out. He shot himself. His body was recovered in the bunker along with his weapons and stockpiled food and supplies. Investigators discovered that not only had Keller taken photos of the bunker and recorded his plans years before the incident occurred, but he also had videos that documented his mindset at the time. He meticulously prepared and planned right up until the very end, never abjectly stating what it was he was running from. By all accounts, it seemed to be the delusional unraveling of a troubled and paranoid man. Another disturbing factor was that the entire time, Keller had been providing insight into his dark plans and intentions, and yet nothing was done, no one was warned, and no one even suspected that such an atrocity was about to occur. In one of his final videos, Keller provided some clarity as to what was going on in his mind, stating, I'm getting to the point where just trying to live and pay bills and live as a civilian and go to work, that just freaks me out. It's actually more comfortable for me to think about living out here, robbing banks and pharmacies, just taking what I want for as long as I can. At least it will be exciting. It won't be boring, and I don't have to worry about Linity or Kayleen, and everything will be taken care of. It will just be me. Investigators were able to uncover a treasure trove of information, including sketches dating back to 2003 and several digital photos, which showed how Keller managed to design and build the bunker. He had diverted water from a nearby stream to run through PVC pipes into the bunker, and also wrote that he wanted to build a laboratory to study viruses. The bunker was even equipped with cement flooring and a wood-burning stove, as well as a working chimney. As for how investigators were able to track down the bunker's location, the digital photos that hadn't been burnt in the Keller's North Bend home provided a detailed map of the location, showing power lines and outlet malls along the routes. Once the fire had engulfed the home, neighbors were quick
quick to report it, and this quick thinking is what allowed firefighters to put a stop to the blaze before these photographs, computers, devices, and evidence could be burned forever. Had the fire been allowed to consume the home even for a few minutes longer, it's possible that Keller wouldn't have been caught for many more months or possibly even years. Other tips helped law enforcement, such as claims from Kayleen's boyfriend that two weeks before the murders, she had confided in him that her father was building something called Camp Keller in preparation for Doomsday. Kayleen's boyfriend also confirmed that Peter Keller had shown him his expansive gun collection, which included rifles. While at the home before the incident took place, Kayleen's boyfriend reported that everything seemed fine and Kayleen did not comment on her father, only stating that he often took hikes alone on the weekend and was stockpiling supplies at the makeshift fort. In the week before the murders, Peter Keller also reportedly withdrew $6,200 from his bank account and told co-workers at a computer refurbishing store that he might not be returning. As the community grappled with the aftermath, one cannot help but wonder, could more have been done to avert this tragedy? And are there others like Keller slipping through the cracks, hidden in plain sight? The unsettling case of Peter Keller invites contemplation on the fine line between preparedness and paranoia and the urgent need for a vigilant society capable of identifying and addressing signs of the impending catastrophe before it's too late. Keller's meticulous vlogging and planning for a doomsday scenario showcased a troubled mind unraveling, yet the signs went unnoticed until the horrifying act was committed. Based on Peter's comments in his videos, there was speculation that he was suffering from a major depressive disorder. Dealing with his family and the everyday pressures of ordinary life were taking its toll, and this ultimately festered in a delusion or an escape route. Linetti was also, to him, seemingly a burden, as she was on a disability check and could not work. Money was always tight, and he could no longer bear the cost of the life he was living. For Peter Keller, mediocrity seemed worse than death. The case revealed the stark inadequacies in identifying and intervening in Peter Keller's escalating paranoia. Unfortunately, it came at the price of three lives and questions remain unanswered. What chased Peter Keller in the dark recesses of his mind? And why did he have to take his wife and daughter with him? On March 1, 2019, Jamaican-born businesswoman Andrine McDonald went missing after failing to turn up for work. From the start, there was but one suspect, husband Andre McDonald. At first, he stayed silent, but eventually, the brutal truth of an American dream turned nightmare would be revealed. When 29-year-old Andrine McDonald was reported missing by her mother Maureen, deputy sheriffs wasted no time in visiting the McDonald home within a gated community in San Antonio. Upon arrival, it wasn't long before the deputy spotted some peculiar signs of foul play. Blood and hair were visible on a light switch in the bedroom, and in the beautifully manicured backyard, a suspicious burn pile was present. The remnants of a zipper were visible within the ashes, indicating that an article of clothing had been mysteriously and purposefully burnt. A blood smear was also found on the door in the bathroom, and Andrine's cell phone, keys, and purse were still in the home, which only further raised suspicion that something horrible had taken place. Both of her vehicles were still parked in the driveway, ruling out any possibility that she had voluntarily gone somewhere and simply forgotten her belongings at home. As the deputy combed through the home, he noticed more red flags. The carpet in the master bedroom had been freshly cleaned, and there was a small amount of blood on the bathroom floor. On Andrine's Chevrolet Malibu, a small suspicious dent could be seen on the rear, and the tires were covered in light-colored gravel, indicating a recent trip on a dirt road. While the welfare check was being conducted, Andre McDonald arrived back at the home. He told the deputy that he had been at the Baptist's emergency hospital checking to see if Andrine had been admitted as a patient after he woke to find her missing. According to him, the orderlies told him that she was being treated there. But when the deputy phoned the hospital to confirm while there was a female patient with the surname McDonald, no Andrine McDonald was being treated at the facility. Andre was confronted with this evidence but had no explanation saying the last time he had seen Andrine was the previous evening when the two had argued over the business they shared. He told officers he went to the gas station and then a nearby park to cool off, returning later that night where he and Andrine went to sleep in separate bedrooms. Officers decided to detain Andre, who requested a lawyer and refused to answer any further questions. While he was in custody, forensics was conducted on the blood found in the home, which was discovered to be a positive match with Andrine. On March 2nd, Andre was released from custody. For the next 12 hours, he attempted to cover up his tracks. Security cameras at Lowe's hardware store showed Andre loading his cart with gardening tools such as a shovel, hatchet, and gloves, as well as two five-gallon gas containers. 
His manner of payment was also odd. For the first transaction, he used his debit card. For the second, he used cash. He then stopped at a local gas station to fill up the containers. As the investigation continued, law enforcement sent a team to observe the McDonald household. When they arrived, they were shocked to find that the garage door had been torn off its hinges. The team then spotted Andre leaving the house and decided to follow him. He was tracked to a nearby gun shop where he purchased a pistol and several rounds of ammunition. He paid for the purchase, but in a perplexing move, he left the shop without the gun, ammunition, or even his ID. As he exited the gun shop, deputies apprehended him, once again taking him into custody, fearing he was in the throes of a mental health crisis. When Andre was detained a second time, officials noticed cuts on his hands. When he was asked about this, he gave several contradictory stories as to how he had acquired them. It was obvious to all that Andre was hiding something. Back at the McDonald's home, investigators got to work examining the property. They observed that in the back of Andrine's Porsche Macan, there was a shovel that had recently been placed there. Based on this new development, the team obtained a search warrant and was able to access the home once more, where they discovered several items that hadn't been there on the first walkthrough. In the backseat of the Malibu was a hatchet, and in the trunk, a newly purchased roll of plastic. The Porsche also contained several items such as a box of heavy-duty plastic bags, an axe, and some gloves. Investigators also found a plastic bag containing a claw hammer covered in plant debris and blood splatter. Andre had carefully packed these items, clearly intent on carrying out some laborious task. The blood on the hammer was tested and confirmed to match Andrine. Although the puzzle was slowly coming together, authorities still needed to uncover the missing piece. One thing was for certain, Andre McDonald had something to do with Andrine's disappearance. In the following days, a massive search was launched. Authorities suspected that Andre had disposed of his wife's remains, and they were determined to find her. Meanwhile, due to limited evidence against him, Andre's bail was reduced, and he was released and placed under house arrest. He refused to join in on the search for his missing wife, once again pinning suspicions against him. Investigators began conducting interviews with family and friends, trying to discover a potential motive. Reportedly, tensions had been growing between the couple since 2016, when Andrein suddenly told Andre not to come home while he was out of state on an Air Force training mission. When he did inevitably return, he discovered that Andrein had acquired two new tattoos, a date on her wrist and an infinity symbol with the letter A. Andre knew that the letter could only stand for one thing, Andrine's ex-boyfriend's initials. Andrine's ex-boyfriend Aubin had a matching tattoo on his chest, confirming Andre's worst fears. As for the date on Andrine's wrist, it was that of Aubin's birth date. Andre filed for divorce, however the proceedings were abruptly stopped in 2017. For the next three years, he and Andrine settled into a smooth co-parenting routine. But in 2019, old resentments began flaring up once more after Andrine expressed her desire to return to Jamaica to be with Aubin. On July 11, 2019, a local farmer smelled a foul odor while driving a tractor on the length of his property just six miles from the McDonald's home. There, by the tree line of the property, was a human skull. The remains had been concealed with wood and the bones of a dead cow. There was also evidence that they had been set on fire. Officials soon confirmed that the skeletal remains were human and belonged to Andrine. Andre was immediately placed under arrest under suspicion of first-degree murder. Due to delays, his trial would only begin in early 2023. Shockingly, just three days before testimony was due to begin, Andre called Andrine's mother Maureen and confessed to murdering her daughter. According to Andre, Andrine allegedly attacked him during an argument, and he was forced to defend himself. Andrine allegedly fell during the struggle, and while she was down, Andre kicked her hard twice. He claimed that he had not intended to kill her. Maureen recounted the tale to the court, describing that Andre had told her that after he had kicked his wife, he could hear her wheezing. Andre then went upstairs after hearing his young daughter's footsteps. Thirty minutes later when he returned, Andrean was dead. Forensic pathologists were able to determine that Andrean's death was due to homicidal violence, including blunt force trauma. But the exact cause of death could not be concluded due to the state of her remains. Several injuries were found, such as a fracture on Andrean's spine and a fractured jaw, more than likely caused by a heavy object rather than a forceful kick as Andre had claimed. Andre's search history was also exposed in court, with over 249 searches relating to DNA, autopsies, and broken necks. Some of the terms included, how does an autopsy work? How long does it take for bones to turn to dust? 
DNA decay in humid weather, and do police need probable cause to search your car? When Andre took the stand, he claimed he'd learned of the affair as well as a scheme for all the business assets, which the couple shared, to be transferred into Andrine's name entirely. In his opinion, to gain full access to the assets, Andrine and Aubin were planning on having him killed. But the prosecution argued that if anything, this provided even more motive for Andre to kill his wife in cold blood. Andre claimed that on the day of the murder, he had learned that Andrine had secretly set up a new business called Elena Property Management, using the couple's joint business assets. To Andre, this was confirmation that his wife was planning on effectively robbing him. Andre claimed that he and Andrine began arguing and he threatened to file for divorce. Back at the house, she allegedly lashed out and the two entered into an altercation which resulted in Andre headbutting her and cutting her face. After seeing the damage, Andrine allegedly became enraged and attacked Andre. Andre alleged that when Andrine attacked him, he was afraid for his life, as his wife regularly power lifted and knew how to throw a punch. Andre stated that he managed to subdue her, flip her over, and then deliver the final fatal kicks. Once Andrine was dead, he drove her body out to the remote countryside before returning with a hammer and gasoline. He stripped his wife naked and set her body on fire. Once the flames had subsided, he began attacking her corpse with the hammer, smashing into her again and again. Despite this admission of rage and unexplained vitriol against his wife's burnt corpse, Andre pled self-defense. After the defense and prosecution presented their closing statements, the jury was sent to deliberate. After 11 grueling hours, they were deadlocked. The judge invoked the Allen charge, urging the undecided voters to come to a unanimous decision, and after another hour of deliberation, a verdict was reached. Andre McDonald was found not guilty of murder, but guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter. Despite the obvious rage and spite in Andre's actions, such as violently desecrating his wife's body and covering up his tracks, the jury seemed to determine that it was not premeditated. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison with an additional five years for tampering with evidence. Throughout the trial, one thing was shockingly clear. Andre had no remorse for what he had done, even appearing uninterested at times and looking up only when Andrine's bones were presented to the jury. As the chilling saga of Andrine McDonald's tragic demise unfolded in the courtroom, the conclusion left a bitter taste of injustice and unanswered questions. Andre McDonald's confession to the gruesome acts surrounding his wife's death and the subsequent legal proceedings seemed to unravel a twisted tale of resentment and violence. The jury's surprising verdict of manslaughter over murder, despite the brutality exhibited, raised eyebrows and stirred public disbelief. The conflicting narratives, Andre's lack of remorse, and the unsettling details surrounding Andrine's demise linger casting shadows over the credibility of the justice system and whether Andre truly paid for what he had done.